from the 1980s to the 1990s, the drug epidemic cost millions of lives and billions of dollars. The use of crack cocaine exploded on the streets of South Central Los Angeles, increasing violence and crime all over the city. The incarceration rate increased as the homicide rate grew exponentially. The decade of dreams actually began over 40 years ago with Pastor Tommy Barnett to reach the lost and broken of Los Angeles. This dream flowed over into a young man named Matthew Barnett. It's not about us, it's about helping others while you're hurt. Who wanted to love and serve people who were hurting. Jesus was the example of this. Whenever the pain was strongest in Jesus' life, he served the most. Matthew noticed the old, vacant Queen of Angels Hospital in Echo Park, and he saw his father's dream could become a reality. This was only the beginning. Welcome to the Dream Center. Hello, and welcome to the Los Angeles Dream Center. I'm Pastor Caroline, and I am so glad you could join me today and be a part of this special place where God is working to change lives, make a difference in the community, and restore those who are broken and hurting. Here at the Dream Center, we see a lot of people who have gone down a rough path, made some difficult choices, and found themselves lost or feeling abandoned. Since 1994, when Matthew and Tommy Barnett launched the Dream Center, our mission has been to reconnect isolated people to God and a community of support by providing basic services that address immediate and long-term needs in areas of homelessness, hunger, poverty, addiction, education, and human trafficking. One of the first programs we launched here at the Dream Center was our residential men's and women's discipleship program. This is a one-year program that is completely free to anyone who is in need of a second chance at life. Most recovery programs are short-term, but what we found is that it takes time to truly rebuild lives and equip people with the tools they need to make a change. At any given time, we have over 700 residents from all walks of life living at the Dream Center. Many of them work on the campus building job skills or volunteering in the community. It's amazing to see people taking on these new roles, becoming leaders, and finding their confidence in God. An example of this is His Hands Clothing Outreach, which serves about a thousand people, providing free clothing to those who might otherwise go without. The outreach gives us the incredible opportunity to not only bless our community and people in residential programs here at the Dream Center, but also provides job training for people like Natasha. Natasha grew up in a Christian home, but struggling with abandonment issues and low self-worth, found herself rebelling and moving out of her parents' house. Struggling to survive, she found herself making tough choices and getting into situations difficult to escape. Now here is the story of Natasha. My name is Natasha. Um, I'm 24 years old. Uh, I was born in San Diego, California, uh, and my biological mom put me up for adoption. I had a good childhood growing up. My dad was a pastor, and um, my mom was a teacher. You know, they tried to, like, teach me the Bible and um, teach me about God and Jesus, but it just never really resonated with me. And I think it was, it was hard because you, um, you, go to, you go to church and, you know, you everyone sees like the best side of your family and the best side of um especially the pastor and then you go home and obviously not everyone you know obviously you live life you're not at your best all the time i was homeschooled for like a lot of my life um and went to like private christian schools and then in high school i went to public school for the first time I did not make friends very well. I felt kind of isolated because it was just me and them. Again, like kind of always struggled with having close friends. Thank you. 
And then being an only child, like I just felt alone a lot. Yeah, it was hard. Um, and yeah, I just always felt like there were like these standards that I wasn't living up to, um, no matter what I did. My parents were very conservative, very strict, um, but loving. Even though like I went to church and went to great schools and all these extracurricular activities, um, I just felt like I wasn't good at anything. I felt abandoned by my birth mom. It was weird because I knew that, like, I knew my adopted parents had wanted me. But I just always carried, like, this feeling that, like, my real mom didn't want me and just left me. Interpreted that as, like, something was wrong with me and that that was my fault. I step out, I'm stepping out in faith, but I know this for, for sure, is I'm doing it for God's glory and for His kingdom. Commit your ways to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Even though at times I like probably knew like cognitively that that wasn't true, I still felt that way. I just felt like I didn't know who I was. I felt like I didn't belong where I was. And that was just something I carried um, with me from as early as I can remember. I like tried to find my identity in getting good grades and being a model student. Um, and that worked for a little while, but midway through high school, I completely lost my faith in God. There were like a couple of events that happened around that time, like my grandma dying and just really normal stuff that happens in life, but because I was already so insecure and already struggling, like it just was overwhelming. Towards the end of high school, I like really started to rebel outwardly for the first time, even though inwardly I had a rebellious heart for a while. My senior year of high school, I grew really depressed. I basically wasn't eating, I was cutting myself, I was failing classes like left and right. I just really needed help and I wasn't really getting any help. My parents were trying to do the best they can but they didn't really know what to do with me and um, I didn't know what to do with me <laughs> and I barely graduated high school. I moved out of my parents' house basically to the street. I started drinking, started partying and smoking weed um, with all my friends. I was like half-heartedly going to school, but I didn't really have a job. I wasn't really doing anything. I mean, after like a month or two of that, I was like, well, I need money and I have nothing, you know, nothing else going for me in life. <laughs> and so um, I found an ad on Craigslist to like make a porn video. And so I ended up meeting this guy and shooting my first um, pornographic film. From there, from like my life just spiraled downward. I had zero relationship with God. I had very few friends. I had no relationship with my family. And I was just drinking, partying, started stripping, doing porn videos. After about like six months of that, um, I was working at an adult convention at the convention center in Los Angeles. And 
this guy walked up to me. Oh, you should give me your number. Like, I have a bunch of, like, networking opportunities. Like, I can really help you. Two weeks later, I met him for coffee. And then two days later, he ended up moving into my house with me, which was obviously a huge mistake. And he was like, oh, well, like, none of this is really working for you, so why don't you try escorting? And I was like, well, that doesn't really sound any different. It was a lot different. Um, and so, I, I mean, I didn't know it at the time. I didn't recognize it, but he was a pimp. He went from girl to girl, like, living like this, living off of them. And that was what he'd been doing for his whole adult life. And he was, like, a good 17 years older than me. I was 18. Like, he would have, like, a certain number of clients that I would have to see a day. He was, like, acted like my boyfriend. It was always like, oh, you're doing this for us. I'm going to get a job soon. You're going to keep us together. Like, I love you so much. Just very, very manipulative. Like, I saw a lot of red flags, obviously. Um, I wasn't, like, I wasn't completely naive. But I also wanted to believe so badly that he loved me that I was like okay with it. And even as things got worse and worse and worse and he got more like emotionally and physically abusive, I just, at that point I was like, well, you're really all I have, so I'm just gonna keep doing whatever you want. Eventually, um, after about almost close to a year, I was drinking and like doing so many prescription drugs at the time and I was just completely numb like all the time. A healthy relationship. It's certainly not about a healthy relationship all. that revolves around money. It is not. Making money. Oh my gosh, I make, make you so much money. How you don't just tell me to stop, okay? I tell you what to do. I said get out of the car! I'm not gonna keep telling you over and over again. Now get out! Who else is going to help you? No one's going to help you like I'm going to help you. You know what? You're not helping. No one else is going to do what I've been doing for you, okay? Like, we would fight all the time, but eventually we got in a fight, and he was being physically abusive, and our neighbors, like, came over, and they were like, hey, if you're not quiet, we're going to call the police. And I was like, please, like, please call the police. Like, I had been trying to leave, like, repeatedly, and... I don't want to! No, but you're going to! No, I'm not going because to! Because I'm the only one who takes care of you. Oh, my God! I think once, like, that time I was so serious and they didn't call the police, but I was like, either you leave because it was my house. It was like, either you leave or I'm, like, going to go to the neighbors and call the cops. You don't have any of the answers. I have the answers. So keep your mouth shut and listen. And so he left and I never saw him again, thankfully. So at that point, not only did I have like nothing, but I was also like an emotional wreck. And he had been so controlling on what I wore, what I did every day, what I ate, um, just every aspect of my life. And I remember like a week, like a week after him leaving, I was like in line for food at like McDonald's and I like couldn't even order my own food because I didn't even know what I wanted because it had been so long since I had made any sort of decision for myself. Finally reached out to my parents for help and they let me come home, which was great. Um, and they had so much grace for me, but that wasn't enough. Like I needed, you know, I needed a help. I needed counseling. I needed a lot, um, not just to go home and pretend like nothing had happened and that everything was just gonna be okay from there. I got a normal job for a little while and was going back to school and um, everything was everything was okay, but inside I was just a disaster. I had ruined like my life, basically. I thought that no one would ever love me or want me after everything that I had done. I tried to pray, tried to call out to God, but I didn't feel like I was like deserving of his mercy and I just didn't know, I just didn't know what to do. And eventually that became so overwhelming that I was just back in a mess of alcoholism and drug use and, and then it was worse than like ever before. I 
had to leave my parents and so I was basically living in my car and just doing every drug I could get my hands on and I like I didn't care if my life ended that day and I just felt completely alone smoked weed and drank the entire day that's when I was planning to kill myself and I was just collecting like pills and everything that I would need to actually do it I just felt like I was done like I just wanted my life to be over Wow. Emotionally broken and struggling to find her self-worth, Natasha found herself making decisions that put her into bad situations that she didn't know how to get out of. Leaving her family behind, Natasha found herself relying on men and prostitution to survive. And unfortunately, for a young woman already feeling insecure, this only made things worse. Natasha tried numerous times to get her life together, but without the right kind of support, found herself in a downworld spiral. Really what she was searching for was love and acceptance, something she couldn't find in people, but only in God. However, God never left Natasha's side. Even in her darkest moments, he was standing beside her, waiting, waiting to pick her back up again. That's the faithful and loving God that we have. Isn't it amazing how God cares for us that much? He knows us so intimately. He knows exactly what we need. We just need to reach out to Him, and He is there waiting to restore us. In 1 Peter 5.10 it says, And the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. After everything Natasha had been through, God continues to renew her spirit. God loves us so much. He wants what's best for us. In 1 John 4, 16, it says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. That's the beauty of our Lord. Even when we can't see our own worth, He sees us for who we are and loves us unconditionally. No matter what we've done in the past, He reminds us that our past doesn't define us. Because of supporters like you, we are able to help women like Natasha get a fresh start. Would you help us continue to support young women like Natasha or young men who feel alone and lost? Would you pick up that phone and make a one-time donation or maybe even a monthly donation to help us continue to make a difference? Now let's watch the incredible conclusion of Natasha's story. Thankfully, like instead of following through with the plan that I had, I know now that it was the Lord, but like a friend texted me out of the blue and was like, oh, let's hang out on Christmas night. And um, so I made it another day. And the next day I was like, okay, well, before I do anything so utterly drastic, like maybe I should look for some help. Like maybe I can go somewhere and go to rehab and maybe that'll solve everything. I had heard of the Dream Center, so I applied to the discipleship program, and I applied to a couple other programs, and none of them ever called me, but the Dream Center called me. They're like, you can come in in a month. And so in that month, like, it was the first time in so long that I had had any hope. And even though I was still drinking and using drugs, like, I, like, I look back at my journals that I have from that time period, and there's just such a difference. Like, God, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna like finally know you. I think I'm gonna like finally find what's missing in my life. I was just so ready to be here and so happy to be here. I remember like the first weekend, like it, it was loud on the floor because there was like 50 women. And I was like, this is gonna be really hard. But I think compared to everything that had gone on in the last couple of years, I finally felt like, okay, this is safe. This is gonna be my home for now. Like this is, you know, this is what I need. And my first year was fantastic. Um, it had its hard moments, but I just came to know God in such a real personal way. came to 
love him and understand that he had always been by my side. I just didn't see it. And then the best part, I think, was getting to like be a leader and getting to encourage the other girls and getting to see that like there was a purpose for everything that I had gone through and that it wasn't just a waste. In the discipleship program, like we have people from all walks of life and all kinds of problems and that's that's cool in its own way, but to meet women that have been through like such extremely similar situations, it really helped me to actually like identify like a lot of what had gone on in my life. And then getting to meet women who had been through so many worse things and yet have still come to know God and still have the peace and joy and like light in their eyes now, that was amazing. All along the way, they've always just been so full of love and grace and um, really helped me understand um, like the love that God has for me. God, I don't know why you chose me to like get to see this like great miracle that you've done. And then I'm also like, oh wow, the change that I see in them, like I can see that in myself too. Not only did I finally know God, and not only did my relationship with my family get restored, um, not only did I make like an amazing group of friends, but like all that are like family, I finally found like God's purpose for my life in helping other people and being able to minister out of my own pain into their pain, and that um, that has been incredibly rewarding. I just finished my associate's degree in sociology. Um, I got a 4.0 last semester, and um, I want to continue to get my bachelor's in social work. I want to work with victims of um, trafficking, and I've gotten to do that a little bit here, and I just love it. In the discipleship program, like we have people from all walks of life and all kinds of problems, and that's that's cool in its own way, but to meet women that have been through like such extremely similar situations um it really helped me to actually like identify like a lot of what had gone on in my life and then getting to meet women who had been through so many worse things and yet have still come to know god and still have the peace and joy and light in their eyes now that was amazing it's a, it's something i like thank the lord for all the time because like in high school i didn't have great friends and then uh, you know, as an adult, it was just mostly people that either like wanted to party with me or were just around when it was fun. And here I have met like good, wonderful friends that like are, are there, you know, no matter what, whether I am like super fun that day or whether I'm not. There is hope and that all things can be made new in Jesus and look for a way out. I mean, call the Dream Center, <laughs> that's what I would probably say first. And just to not give up hope and to not let, not let things that have happened to you become the only way that you think about yourself. Like, know that there is a future for you and there is a hope for you. And there are people in the world that want to help you. Being in my second year and going kind of back out into the world and going to school and stuff and just Seeing how my character has changed and that I have perseverance. That I truly do rely on the Lord for strength and that I don't just work out of my own strength. I don't have it all together. I don't look great every day. Like I don't, you know, and none of that really matters because it's really not important. When I see myself as you know, a child of God and as someone that the Holy Spirit resides in and works through, there that's where I can have self-worth. And now I've been here in almost another full year. Gotten to go back to school and volunteer in different ministries around campus and work here. 
and all of that is great, but ultimately, like, the peace and joy of just spending each day with the Lord, and each day knowing that His mercies are new that morning, that's irreplaceable. Isn't that a beautiful story? God took Natasha's history and turned it into a bright future full of hopes and dreams. God waited patiently for Natasha to return to Him, restoring her heart and instilling in her a passion to work with women, especially those with similar circumstances. God gave Natasha a place to belong where she feels loved and wanted. She has found community, one that she can consistently count on. Natasha now knows God loves her no matter what she has done that He is faithful and that He has been standing beside her all along. He is her Father, loving her exactly the way that she is. That's how personal our God is. He knows everything about us. He knows our history and He knows our future. But it's when we can give that future to Him that we can let go and truly be free. He can take our lives, restore our purpose, and help us to find our calling. When we walk with God, He will lead our steps in the right direction. Thank you so much for being here today and watching Natasha's story, seeing the kind of impact we can have here at the Dream Center. All of our programs are completely free, but it takes generous support of donors like you to keep our programs running. Please consider giving to the Dream Center a one-time gift or even a monthly donation and help make a difference in someone's life. For any gift of $50 or more, or any monthly donation, you will receive Matthew Barnett's God's Dream for You. Your generous contributions keep our doors open and keep programs like discipleship, foster care intervention, food trucks, human trafficking, adoptive block, and so much more going. Thank you for watching and join us again next week for another amazing story about what God is doing here at the Dream Center.